Well, we've all seen the stories, witnessed the horrific consequences. London, Manchester, Paris, Kabul, Berlin, Ottawa, 9-11. The details all fresh in our minds, and it's clear that for many of you, there are questions you feel are not being answered. Tonight, we try, with some people with the backgrounds to help. Joining us from Ottawa, Stephanie Carvin, who can talk about counterterrorism. From Detroit, Saeed Khan, whose focus tonight is Muslims in the West and identity politics. And here in Toronto, Samantha Nutt, who will answer questions on homegrown terrorism. And Mubin Sheikh, who can talk about intelligence and de-radicalization. So let's uh, get started with the first question that we've got uh, from you for tonight. And it uh, came in on Twitter, actually. J.M. Davis asked this, and Stephanie, uh, I'll ask you to try and answer it. The question is, should Canada develop a similar strategy or media plan that the UK has with its run, hide, and tell? And just to explain this, if you haven't heard of it already, on Friday night or Saturday night when the attacks happened in London, uh, the authorities in the UK put this out on, on Twitter, this symbol, run, hide, and tell. And this was kind of the... Um, uh, the advice that uh, police were giving and other uh, civic authorities throughout London, if you find yourself in a situation where uh, it looks difficult, there's been an attack or there's something going on, run first, then hide, and then tell. Get on the phone, tell somebody. Um, Sheila, is this, uh, do we have, does Canada have a plan? Stephanie, sorry, does, this, uh, does Canada have a plan like that? As far as I'm aware, Canada does not have a plan. What I have seen in the past are uh, basically using the U.S. version of the program, which is actually run, hide, fight, that they actually use in businesses and government offices in case there is a shooter in the building. I think anything that can promote resilience without promoting fear is something that should be adopted in, in order to, uh, you know, this wouldn't just be useful in a terrorist attack. It could also be a mass shooting incident, for example. But, you know, at the same time, you don't want it to be a way to kind of spread more panic than I think is what would be needed. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, next question is for uh, Sam, and it comes from uh, Cindy Blackstock. Uh, who is, uh, is a good friend of ours, who uh, has been a guest on this program, actually. Studies show you are more likely to be killed by lightning than a terrorist. How do we put the risk and investments in context? Sam. Peter, I think that's actually a great statistic to consider, uh, and, I, and I think it's critically important. When you look at where terrorism is happening throughout the world, there, it is 50 times greater still in countries that are in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, than it is in Europe and the Americas. I mean, even in the last week, 100 dead in Afghanistan, more than 30 killed in an explosion in Baghdad. So we need to put that context, at least the European, the Western world context, into a certain amount of a, of a reality check. Um, it, is, it is a risk. It is something we need to take very seriously, but at the same time, we shouldn't overstate that risk because, frankly, that does play into the hands of those who would who would seek to unsettle us and to uh, to impose that kind of fear. All right, Mubin, here's one for you. Um, Darren Ilk asks this: What is being done to track Caucasian terrorists, like the man from the Quebec mosque attack? We we, we do tend to always hear about uh, the non-Caucasians who are being tracked. What's being done to track Caucasians? Well, I mean, the uh, intelligence services and police services use the same tools, uh, di regardless of what group it is. Uh, there's no, there are no special surveillance t uh, tools for Muslims only and for white people something else. So uh, they're using the exact same tools. Uh, it can range from uh, human intelligence gathering, actual spies in groups, monitoring social media, intercepting communications, the whole gambit. Okay. Uh, Saeed, here's one for you. Uh, DK Speed uh, asked this via Facebook. Don't you think it's about time we close our borders now? Don't you think we should slow this immigration policy down? Do we want to end up like Europe? Um, you've seen this debate play out in, in your country, Saeed, and now here's somebody suggesting uh, that the same uh, issue should be debated here in Canada. How do you, uh, how do you react to that? Well, to, uh, to go along with what Sam was talking about regarding statistics, uh, even in the United States, the chances of uh, being killed by a refugee or by an immigrant 
are far, far less than being killed by somebody who is a born and bred American citizen. We saw this as the case in Colorado, where a young man uh, shoots up a, a movie theater, or for example, a, uh, a kindergarten in, uh, in Connecticut. So this idea then that this is a problem that will go away simply by going ahead and putting up uh, walls and uh, by uh, excluding immigrants uh, from coming to the country, that may solve one problem that isn't in front of us right now, but that's not doing anything about feeling safer when it comes to not only homegrown uh, American citizens in the case of my country, but also a rising tide of white supremacy and uh, hypernationalism, which is a bigger threat by far. Uh, next question comes from uh, from Twitter, and I I, I got to tell you this is one we debate a lot here in our own newsroom, so I'll, I'll try to handle it for for us. Uh, Vasuki asks. Why do media pay attention to certain terror attacks while ignoring others? Um, this is a good question because there are terror attacks, I was going to say every day, They're not every day, but very frequently. Uh, certainly some in parts of the world that don't get the attention others do. We, uh, you know, we talk obviously about the ones in London and Paris, and Berlin, Ottawa, Washington, New York. Uh, Last week we did, we did a, a fairly lengthy piece on an attack in Kabul where nearly 100 people died. But having said that, there are lots of other attacks, terror attacks, that happen in different parts of the world uh, that we don't uh, report on every day. Or if we do, it's, it's fairly short. It's what we call a copy story, a couple of lines that I read as opposed to a report. That's partly because... Um, you know, we don't always have people in all parts of the world to cover these things. There have been a number of terrorist attacks in the Philippines in the, in, in the uh, last few years, for sure. Uh, we sent Adrian there just a, a couple of months ago, Adrian Arsenault, about a month ago, and she did a whole series reporting on the difficulties that the Philippines uh, has had. Now, having said all that, um, you're right, we don't, and we have to re-examine how we handle those things because there is an inequity in the way we report on different parts of the world when it comes uh, to terror. All right, let me uh, move on to the next one. This one is for Sam um, from Facebook. Kathy, I'm sorry, Kathy, I may get your name wrong here. In Govan, my daughter is flying to London tomorrow. Is this safe? Now, you were, you were just there a couple of days ago. All of us pass through London fairly frequently, but you're the last one there. Is it safe? Yeah, I think my answer to Kathy would be that, uh, in fact, the morning after the Manchester bombing, I got on a plane to London with my 12-year-old son in tow because I was already booked to speak at, uh, to speak at Cambridge. And, and um, I mean, look, things can happen at any time. It's important to remain vigilant and to be cautious and to be alert. And that's true whether you're traveling in London or Paris or Brussels or even in, in Toronto. We all, I think, right now, given the state of the world, need to be on guard, um, but not live in a state of paranoia and fear. And, um, you know, I think one of the most challenging things for me, Ryan, in England. I've spent many years living in England uh, over the last couple of decades and uh, you know, it's just to see the, the heavy police presence, the armed presence, guys with assault rifles, well police with assault rifles and it's just a constant reminder that that, uh, that the world is changing, it's shifted and um, you know I think for all of us the one thing that we can hope for is that our children will still be able to experience uh, the, the right to travel and, and the freedom that comes with that because it's critically important. So get on that plane is what I would say. You tried to take your son to Buckingham Palace for the changing of the guard and on that it was cancelled because, in fact, we arrived and there had been a, a, a guy who had been arrested wielding a knife just a few minutes before. So, um, again, you have to be on your guard, but I think it's really important that we send that message of, of resilience, especially at this moment in time. All right. Stephanie, this one's for you. Nick Gaming via YouTube asks, at what point do we give up privacy for security and how far do we go on that? I think that's a very difficult question and one certainly we've seen the Liberal government uh, dealing with uh, in the response to the Green Paper it put out. It, it released a report about a month ago and the consensus was that actually people who are interested in this topic, people who responded to the government's questions are not interested in giving up privacy uh, going forward. And, you know, mass surveillance is not particularly useful for intelligence collection and analysis. What you want are targeted collection on, you know, a set of risk factors, risk factors that are showing that someone may in fact be mobilizing, when in fact, you know, with this kind of mass surveillance, what you're actually getting is just a lot of data and not a lot of quality analysis. And, and that can actually confuse things as opposed to 
to uh, help things. So I think, you know, there needs to be a, a focus here on protecting privacy. That's certainly important. And I think to the extent that some people want to give up those privacy rights, don't necessarily consider the way that intelligence analysis works with uh, domestic uh, extremism. The fact that you want uh, to, you know, be more targeted rather than this kind of mass surveillance that, that might be seen as a panacea through algorithms or what it be, but really can sometimes just create uh, more noise. All right. Move when you were in the intelligence business, but I saw you agreeing with what Stephanie was saying there. I got to take a break in 30 <laughs> seconds, but you, you were, had agreement on that. Yeah, wide net spying doesn't work. Uh, the NYPD tried it uh, and outright came out and said it doesn't work. Uh, targeted collection is the only way to go. All right. We're going to take that quick break and then more of your questions. So keep them coming in. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. We're back with your questions, so let's, uh, let's get right back to it. Uh, Saeed, this one's for you. It's from Justin Ballack. Asks via YouTube, I'm an air cadet from Kitchener, Ontario, and I was wondering, is Canada really that more safe than the UK? So you're watching from the outside, Saeed, and what do you right. think? Well, I mean, I can only see uh, what I see from Canada and from the CBC about what's going on. And uh, uh, it seems as though it's much safer than the UK. That's not to say that the UK is a bedlam of, uh, of a lack of safety. Again, we have to really contextualize and uh, make proportionate these incidents. They are still um, far, far fewer than, for example, even what happened in the UK during the Troubles, a time when I was living in the UK and there were always threats by the IRA, bomb threats as well as actions that were taken out. What we find is that, uh, of course, everybody now is internalizing a lot of what's going on thanks to technology, thanks to advanced communications. Uh, literally, something that happens half a world away is felt as though it's happening next door. So that is creating a perception or a misperception that perhaps Canada is somehow less safe than other parts of the world. And as Sam aptly put, there's a lot more that's happening in places like Asia and in Africa than are happening in the West still. All right. Stephanie, um, this one's for you from Twitter. Jane G. V. McCaughey, how do uh, the media and the government responses to Saturday's attack in London compare to those in 2005? That was the 7-7 attacks in London. And I'm asking you, um, uh, Stephanie, because you were living there at the time, and uh, what, is, what does this say about security perceptions today compared with then? Well, certainly in 2005, the UK was not a stranger to terrorism. It had, of course, lived through the uh, IRA bombings that had taken place for a number of decades beforehand. I think what the shock of 2005, though, was the idea that jihadi terrorism wasn't necessarily something that came from without. It could also come from within, and it could be very deadly. So you basically had a kind of foreign fighter attack, individuals who'd gone abroad, gotten training, and were able to conduct an attack. And I think that was, was what was so shocking. So to compare that to today, you know, sadly, even though the UK has had a number, uh, sorry, a, a fairly good track record up until this year with regards to preventing violent extremist plots. Uh, you know, we're kind of used to seeing these images now, whether in Paris or Brussels. So, uh, so I think we can actually say that, you know, we can contextualize these attacks a little bit differently. And we're seeing that in the media as well, in, in terms of uh, the messages being sent, even if uh, some of the images are, in fact, gory. All right. Sam, um, you can pick up on this because it, it, it reflects some of the comments that we've all been making tonight here. Patrice Robinson asks via Facebook, what precisely does be on guard and remain vigilant look like? What are you suggesting that a regular person do to stay, stay safe in this climate? I, I may not be the best person to answer that question, Peter, because I've been going in and out of war zones for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I'm always the kind of person who is looking, uh, when I sit down, to, I always want to know where the nearest exit is. I always want to know what my strategy will be uh, should something happen. And I don't think that's a very normal, nor is it a healthy way to live your life. Um, but what I would say is, and it sounds like a cliche because it is the tagline that gets used around the world, but if you see something, say something. You know, if, you, if something looks as if it's, uh, if somebody's looking uh, as if they're uh, about to carry something out, if they're, 
uh, behaving in a way that's particularly aggressive, if you see a car that's veering towards you, um, just, just remain alert, remain vigilant. And unfortunately, that's hard to do at this, uh, this day and age. You know, a lot, a lot of us, we're looking at our phones, we're distracted, we're thinking about other things. But, um, you know, it's, I, it's not that it's a guarantee, um, but by paying attention, you don't know. Uh, you might pick up on something and it might change your life. Yeah, and I, you know, and I don't think what you've been doing for 20 years is a bad thing for, for most people to think of. I mean, I, I know that I still, when I get on a plane, and I've been flying for 50 years, um, that, uh, that I always look, well, what would I do if something happened? Where would I yeah. go? Where's the nearest exit? All those kind of little things. And you can think about that, whether you're in a plane or a restaurant or, or, or what have you. Uh, Moving. here's one for you. Uh, Josh Michael asks via Facebook, does the Canadian government spend enough money on counter-terrorism? On counter-terrorism? Uh, I mean, it depends on, you know, traditionally we understand counter-terrorism as being uh, the, the hard approach. Um, countering radicalization should be separated from counter-terrorism. Uh, so when it comes to counter-terrorism, look, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm biased in the sense that I'm uh, pro-national security uh, and so, look, we can always spend more. Uh, that's, that's the reality. We really can. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, upping um, uh, special forces capabilities specifically to protect Canada, like JTF2 units, um, uh, uh, and also what our, our forces are doing overseas. You know, do they have the equipment they need? I mean, that might fall under defense, but counterterrorism is a part of defense. So we okay. can always spend more. Saeed, here's one for you from Twitter. Paul Bruce asks, when are we going to stop aiding and abetting terrorists by arming Saudi Arabia? And, you know, the, 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 uh, your country is doing that. Canada is doing that. Well, and, and in quite large numbers uh, <laughs> after the latest uh, trip by uh, mm -hmm. President Trump to was the region. Was it $100 billion? Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, a lot of letters of intent, to be fair, uh, were signed, so I don't know how much of that is going to go through. But between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, over the last several years, billions of dollars have been spent. And you mentioned earlier in the broadcast about how now both of those countries are uh, uh, freezing ties with Qatar, so they're having a bit of a skirmish in their own backyard. But I think this is such an important point to recognize the connectedness, not only of the world itself when it comes to one region and another, but also when it comes to policies that then create an action and a reaction. So here we are in the case of Saudi Arabia particularly, which has of course been accused of uh, spreading at least the ideology of extremism. And now of course with social media and the internet, it has literally gone viral. The idea then of how policies either help promote this inadvertently or explicitly is a big challenge that we're facing. And when the public actually does speak up uh, to their respective governments, oftentimes these fall on deaf ears. All right. Got to leave it there for a moment. We're going to take another break, but we will be back. Keep those questions coming. We're going to take that quick break, then answer more of your questions. All right, into our final block. We've got six minutes, so let's get right to the questions here. Um, and the first one is for Mubin from Ali Khan Samani asks via Facebook, why is there such a lack of education on the diversity of Muslims? That's a very good question. I think, uh, I think partly that's the fault of the Muslims uh, to, to have people understand that, you know, there are lots of us. There are three million in, or uh, one million in Canada alone. Uh, half of which live in the GTA, and um, that's the Greater Toronto, a greater area, Toronto area, area, right. area. Outside of Toronto, and so I think the problem is that most people just don't realize that we are not one monolithic group, and uh, you know media entities reinforce that sometimes, politicians and others, and I think uh, we need to get away from that. All right, uh, Stephanie, question from Twitter, Pavo Burrell, the predictable thoughts and prayers tweets by various leaders like uh, uh, Justin Trudeau are empty and cold, when will real reaction happen? Somebody looking for real, real action against terror. When do you think that's going to happen? Stephanie. Well, I actually think it's important for leaders to convey 
uh, their well wishes when you have a terrorist attack occur. I mean, uh, certainly you don't want the kind of Donald Trump tweets that we've been seeing going forward. This is not the right message to send. In terms of real action, I mean, this question was raised today with Theresa May, who uh, it, over the last, you know, 24 hours has basically said, you know, the time for political correctness uh, or whatever is, is over. Uh, and, you know, the question is, what more legislatively can we actually do? The UK has passed a terrorism bill uh, every two years. We have legislate, you know, there's, they have over a hundred statutes in, since 2000 with the word terrorism in the title. So, you know, what real action is, I mean, I think we've had a good conversation tonight about trying to foster better understanding and context uh, as, as a starting point to have a better conversation about terrorism generally. All right. Uh, Saeed, this one's for you. Hayden King asks via Facebook, how should we react to the U.S. government's negative take on for foreigners? Um, well, certainly by the U.S. president uh, of late, uh, to uh, foreigners who many people would think are their normal allies of the United States. How should we react to this? Well, if I were outside the United States, uh, for example, in Canada, I would implore you not to follow the model that is being presented by the American president. And uh, to those who are in the United States, I would similarly uh, remind them that uh, all of us, uh, with the exception of the Native Americans, have migrated to the United States. And certainly here, there have been various times where other uh, immigrant groups, Jews, Catholics, Irish, Poles, uh, have been demonized. Uh, of course, along with African Americans. Uh, there, this is part of the history of the United States. It's important to be honest about the history of the United States, but also to recognize that no one is not an immigrant. Uh, no one is not a foreigner to the shores. Sam, this one's for you from Malik Ayas. What can we do as citizens to keep the peace in our cities? And I guess what, what that question is about is, is the peace between diverse groups, the peace between the way we talk to each other, react to each other, certainly on social media at times. What can we do? I don't think it's that complicated, Peter. I think it's about empathy and understanding. I think it's about not reacting to uh, incidents like what's been happening in the, the United Kingdom from a place of hatred and anger, which will only further those tensions, further those resentments. If there is a time to sort of reach across the aisle and take your neighbor's hand and shake it and introduce yourself properly, um, now's the time. And, uh, and the more that we polarize this conversation, the more we, that we react from a place of, of uh, misunderstanding and resentment and fear, uh, the more we give groups like ISIS the advantage. And we need to remember that they are reacting this way because they're being pressed, because they're being pushed out of Mosul, because they're seeing their territory dwindle. And in, in reality, this is a sign of weakness on their part. It doesn't feel like weakness to us because we experience it firsthand. Um, it is, uh, but nevertheless, I think that now is the time for us to remain, um, just remain, remain who we are, remain true to, to what it means to be Canadian, which is I believe a message of inclusiveness. All right, I've only got a minute left, so this will be quick. But it's a good last question. Why is nobody discussing the root causes of terrorism or the impact of our foreign policy? Mubin, you want to try that? Oh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, great quote. Ideology without grievances doesn't resonate, and grievances without ideology are not acted upon. It's the interplay between the two that are the root of terrorism. What would you say, Sam? I mean, I certainly agree. I think that it has been uh, U.S. foreign policy in particular that has resulted, um, the Iraq war, uh, especially in 2003, that has led us uh, to, in part, to where we are now, in large part, to where we are now. And so we do have to consider our foreign policy when it comes to how we prevent terrorism over the long term and be investing in the right kind of development activities to ensure that young people in those uh, communities have choices and they have opportunity. Can you answer that in 15 seconds, Stephanie? The only thing I would say, there's a lot of people who disagree with U.S. foreign policy who don't actually mobilize to violence. It, certainly, it's a grievance. I, I kind of like M Mubin's phrasing of it, but it's not necessarily a cause. Last word to you, Saeed. Uh, similar length, please. Sure. Connect the dots, follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> Connect the dots That's and follow right. the money. Fantastic. That seems to apply to so many stories right now. <laughs> Listen, we thank you all, Stephanie Saeed, for joining us from Ottawa and Detroit, and Sam and Mubin here in Toronto.